Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 304. We're continuing with our lesson title, Way Station Earth. This will be part 2. And our principle deals with the souls that are on Earth today have had a relationship with the Creator in eternity. And God has manifested souls to continue His master plan and to continue the relationship that He had with them in eternity to progress it. Scripture teaches one of the main purposes of Earth is that it serves as a jump-off point for beings who once had a relationship with the Creator in eternity. Go to Jeremiah, the first chapter, verse 4 to 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. The word knew there comes from a term meaning <coughs> intimate relationship. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Here we have the principle. The godly have had a prior relationship with the Creator. And life here is a continuation, a preparation, a reestablishment of the relationship and a preparation for a closer relationship with Him in eternity, if we are open to it. Turn to Hebrews, the second chapter, verse 14. For as much then as the children, those who have, this is referring to the eternal relationship before the foundation of the earth, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, in other words, the children are destined to incarnate into the human race, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Referring to before the Prototokos incarnated, Jesus incarnated so that he could prepare the way to establish fellowship, return fellowship with God and to prepare them for the positions that he had called them to in eternity. Now, you said that this refers specifically to those who are predestinated. Yes. So, wouldn't we be also saying partakers of flesh and blood to those who are temporally called? Sure. How do you distinguish the two if you're going to use the same language? Because of the ultimate purpose. Okay. Prototokos are here for the... Uh, um, the... Um, adoption as sons... Those from the earth are here to perpetuate and perfect their life and eternity on the earth. Okay. So context is but the answer. each group is here for a particular purpose. Right. And each group partakes of flesh and blood. Yes. Yeah. Brings us to the next principle. 
scripture indicates those in the Adamic race given understanding of the Lord's book of life. He had an intimate relationship with those that later became prophets and priests and some kings and prepared them through the book that he had written and made them aware of. Now they, we find several references to this in the scripture. Turn to Psalms 139, 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect. In other words, he's saying before he was created, God was aware of him. And in thy book, all were written, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. So what he's talking about is this book which contained all the events that would pertain to him, past, present, and future, before he became who he was. So it's talking about the eternality of the Creator, the desire of the Creator for an intimate relationship with him, and the establishment in the spiritual realm of a pre-existent relationship. Mm -hmm. Turn to Psalms 56, verse 8. Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle, are they not in thy book? So he's talking about the intimate detail of their relationship, that the Lord has even recorded the tears that David would shed in this book. Now, we want to see where YHVH enters into this. Turn to... Genesis, the second chapter. He has a place in this also. They had a relationship with him as well as with Elohim in eternity. Genesis, second chapter, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God, this is YHVH, made the earth and the heavens. The word made there means to accomplish, to do. So it means basically the day in which YHVH was given the run, given authority, given the directorship of the secondary creation, which Lucifer had had prior to that. After the reestablishment, the reconstitution of the creation, it was turned over to YHVH and the Dawnstar hierarchy to administer. Having said that, we want to take a look at some scripture that pertains to his authority in this uh, this creation <clears throat> turn to Psalms 
Jesus declares YHVH to be the God of the Old Testament saints and the authority of them. Turn to Luke. Excuse me, turn to Matthew 22, verse 31 to 32. Matthew 22, verse 31 to 32. is touching the resurrection of the dead have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God now what he's talking about here God is referring to YHVH saying I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac the God of Jacob God is not the God of the dead but of the living he's referring to YHVH as being in charge of all the Old Testament saints in their physical life and in their spiritual life if they died righteously. Now, YHVH was given custodialship over the Old Covenant saints by Elohim. Why? Because Elohim was waiting for the time in which the Father's master plan for the new covenant saints would go into effect. He had to prepare everything for that time. The fall of man, the establishment of Israel, the direction of things to come was all in the hands of Elohim. YHVH ran the system from day to day, established and directed the life of the righteous on the spiritual and the physical plane. We see some examples of this. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes. When Lucifer and his cherubim had the authority and the license to develop the entire secondary creation. He still reported to YHVH, didn't he? Yes. So the work that YHVH picked up as a result of uh, Lucifer being cast out <clears throat> sounds more like um, an addition to his workload. It's not. It, it, it doesn't look like he's he's received some kind of commendation. YHVH has received some some kind of commendation. Just that. The person who previously reported to him is no longer there, therefore he's got to pick up the slack. Yes. Hmm. Yes, that's what Scripture is saying. This is the history of all the life forms from the day that YHVH was given the run over everything. In other words, his authority was indirect at first, then he took direct charge direct over Direct control, everything. okay. After Elohim had completed what he was doing. Hmm. Now this included the book that Elohim had um, apprised those that had a relationship with him of. Did, did Elohim consider that an upgrade for white Uh No, because Elohim knew all the things that were going to happen. And mm. this was just part of his plan. Okay. He knew before the fall of Lucifer that this was going to take place. This was a phase in which things would take place that would culminate in the Father's master plan. Okay. Exodus, 32nd chapter, verse 30 to 33. Now this is a time when Moses He's going up to get the law and the tables 
from YHVH, Israel is flagrantly gone and uh, into rebellion. They want to go back to Egypt. They want to worship gods, all the rest of it. YHVH at this point determines going to wipe them out. <laughs> Exodus 32. Verses 30 to 33. It came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up into the Lord, unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. So Moses knows what the what White Spirit wants to do. And he's about to do something desperate to try to save them. Verse 32, uh, verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. YHVH doesn't tell him it's not his book, it's Elohim's book. But of course, YHVH didn't tell him a lot of things sure. that pertain to Elohim. Mm -hmm. How does YHVH pay for these, I don't want to call them transgressions, but um, it's an overreach. Does he answer for these at some stage? No, he's given authority. Basically, we have to understand he's the creator of the human race. So he has a certain le leader, leeway, leeway mm. in which he can do things. And he's doing these to get them to look at him as a sole authority in this particular capacity. So you could call that taking creative license. Yes, which is exactly what it is. Mm. Anyway, so we see he's given custody of the book. Which brings us to the next principle. <clears throat> This is a book of life. Yes. Mm. Scripture teaches YHVH had authority. Not only did he have custody of the book, he had authority to bring damnation to people whose names was in the book. Scripture teaches YHVH had authority to bring upon those in his charge damnation. Turn to Leviticus 7 chapter verse 21. Now the law that he gave Moses, uh, it's not being taught, but for an infraction of the law, you could uh, you could suffer eternal damnation. We're going to see some examples of that. Leviticus seven verse twenty one. Moreover, the soul that shall touch any uncleaned thing. Is the uncleanness of a man, or any unclean beast, or any abominable unclean thing, and eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which partake unto the Lord, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. Cut off from his people. What does that mean? No. Turn, huh? No. Yeah. Turn to, uh, turn to Exodus, or turn to Genesis. 49th chapter. Verse 33. What does it mean to be cut off from your people? 
Genesis 49, verse 33. <coughs> and when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed, and he yielded up the ghost, and was gathered unto his people. When a soul died in righteousness, he went back into the paradise region, later called Abraham's bosom, and was gathered to the human race, the place where man was created, to exist, to live in glory, which is his paradise region. A soul that would be cut off would be like turn it, Luke, the 16th chapter. Verse 22 and 23. You see example of a soul being gathered to his people and a soul being cut off. And it came to pass when the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. He's being gathered to his people, connected to the human race for eternity in the paradise region. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. His soul is cut off from his people. Mm. This is what they're referring to. <clears throat> YHVH, the law of YHVH, held for an infraction eternal damnation. Yes. So when the rich man's uh, soul went to hell, did the angels carry him to hell, or did, did he just immediately, like a magnet, drawn to he's it? He's drawn to hell. Okay. He just appears there. No, his soul is drawn down to the place that's prepared for him, that he prepared for him. Like Judas, same thing sure. happened to sure. him. Now, turn back to Leviticus 17. Verses 8 to 10. shall say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offereth a burnt offering or sacrifice, and bringeth it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. So he's saying, you offer a sacrifice, you don't bring it to the place where it's supposed to be offered, your soul is forfeit. You're going to be cut off <clears throat> and wind up going to hell. So we're understanding someone attempts to burn their own offering outside their house, for example. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's right. Verse 10, And is whosoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from among the from among his people. Same thing. This is talking about a capital punishment for this offense. When Saul did this, he uh, attempted to offer a sacrifice. Did he do it in the temple or out of the temple? Oh no, he wasn't anywhere near the temple. Okay, so it's, he, he did he did this in verse nine then. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, he had already been condemned, but that just added to it. Sure. 
So we see the law, there are many other, uh, other um, transgressions. Um, some people would um, incur a judgment where they'd be cut off from Israel. That means they would spend the rest of their lives isolated in this life from the nation and ultimately die and go into judgment. Mm. There were different infractions, different penalties for different infractions. The law was very meticulous about you had to do a specific thing in a certain way, otherwise your soul would be forfeit. Now, <clears throat> scripture indicates from the time of the establishment of the new covenant, this book is sealed, no longer in the custody of YHVH, but is awaiting the judgment at the end of the millennium. So when the Lord established the new covenant, the authority over this book was taken from YHVH and restored back to Elohim. Mm. Turn to Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. What book? The books of their works. Mm -hmm. What did you actually call that book? Uh, the books. The, the, the books of everything they've ever done. But do you actually call it the books of their works? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and another book was opened. So the book had been closed which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's why uh, I call it the books of their works. Okay. Uh, so the book is sealed currently. YHVH no longer has authority because the law is no longer applicable. Mm -hmm. Now you're under the new covenant, not the old covenant, which is God's grace. Should we understand, therefore, that the book transfers back to the ownership of Elohim yes. at the point of the age of, age of grace? Yes. So upon his appearance, his, the book is his? Yes. Hmm, okay. Upon his resurrection. His resurrection, yes, of course. Sealed okay. everything. <clears throat> Scripture indicates the Prototokos teachers don't don't operate from this book. They operate from the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Scripture indicates the Prototokos teachers will receive custody of the book of Revelation and fill the whole world with the knowledge of Elohim from it. Revelation 22, verse 10. He said unto me, Seal not the saints of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now, <clears throat> drop down, uh, go to Isaiah 11th chapter, verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Currently, the world is abysmally ignorant, does not have the knowledge of the Lord. It's filled with all sorts of false concepts about God. <clears throat> the job of the Prototokos teachers is to reverse that at the time, beginning with the beginning of sorrows, the world is going to receive 
on a greater and greater scale the true knowledge of Elohim until the time, by the time of the millennial period, the things we're teaching will be common knowledge to every single soul that incarnates into the world. <clears throat> there will be no false concept. Everybody's going to know the true concept of God, who he is, how this all thing started, and what the end will be. Nobody will be in ignorance. It'll be a total reversal of what you have now. And <clears throat> this is what we are being prepared for. If we take up the mantle and go forth, we will add our portion to what ultimately will be an eternal heritage, which we'll be greatly rewarded for.